I'm going to be talking today about this book that I've worked on. Um, and what you'll get are the sort of high points, none of the difficult arguments that get you to them. Um, the subject is aesthetics, art, and evolution, and what they've got in common, or what connects them. And the book is divided into three parts. The first part says what aesthetics is, what art is, what evolution is, and how they might be connected. The second part is on aesthetics, and it's got chapters on um, landscape aesthetics, human beauty, and humans' aesthetic appreciation of non-human animals. And the third part is on art, and it's got four chapters. One is a general chapter, one is a chapter on art as a technology, one's a chapter on art as a spandrel, and the final one is a chapter on particular arts as adaptations. So I'm just going to run through those. What is aesthetics? Um, in the 18th century, it's typically characterised as the perceptual appreciation of objects for their form. And it abstracts away from what the kind of object it is and what its function is, just to look at it as, as a kind of purely formal structure. So on this view, the focus is on a disinterested appreciation of form, and the object of an aesthetic interest has to have sufficient complexity that it presents a form. Now, most philosophers of art have moved away from that narrow conception to a rather broader conception of the aesthetic, in which it takes in the distal senses, not just the, the um, proximate ones, so that you can have you know, aesthetic experience through touch and taste. Um, it allows that we can aesthetically appreciate the way objects perform their functions. And it doesn't necessarily require a complexity in the object of appreciation. And it allows for aesthetic experience of the everyday, or everyday aesthetic experience, rather than having it as a specially heightened, um, disinterested mode of attention to objects. So in general, philosophers these days have broadened the notion of the aesthetic, and I'm in line with that. On the other hand, they don't broaden it nearly so far as most evolutionary theorists and psychologists do. So according to Darwin, um, peahens found peacocks beautiful, and that's why they were drawn to them. That is, he thought that birds had aesthetic taste. And lots of evolutionary psychologists repeat that view. Um, so Randy Thornhill thinks amoebae have aesthetic taste because they're drawn perceptually to some things rather than other things. Now that, I think, is too broad a notion of the aesthetic, and here's why. There are lots of perceptually based pleasurable experiences that don't look like aesthetic experiences. So you look at something and say, how edible? Or you look at something and say, how bettable? And my guess <laughs> is that the peahen is doing the how bettable <laughs> rather than the how beautiful judgment. And in fact, there's lots of stuff on this. So for the most part, I'm inclined to think that animals don't go in for aesthetic appreciation. I mean, it's not a, a rule. There's somewhere you draw the line. I've got no idea where it is. It's almost certainly <coughs> our um, prominent ancestors somewhere. Um, how far back you go? Does it go back to other primates? I don't know. Some people claim that you get aesthetic appreciation from chimpanzees. But the evidence for this is very difficult to interpret. So that's the aesthetic. Um, what's art? I don't offer, you see why it's like speed dating, right? Um, I don't offer a definition of art. Um, I take it we have a fair understanding of what art is. So when I focus on art, one of the questions I ask is how early did it appear? Um, and when you look at the literature on this, there are people who argue that the first artworks were hand axes, and hand axes date back to 500,000 years, but even if you take more sophisticated ones, they go back 200,000 years, and they're pre-homo sapien. So the claim would be that um, hominin species before ours were making art. And why do they think those things are artworks? The answer is because there are more than seem to be necessary. They made outsized ones which when you examine them, were never used as axes. They went to a lot of trouble to make these perfectly symmetrical. They took 
features of the stone and shape the axe to bring those out. So little fossils or little bits of mineral in the stone. All those suggest at least some kind of aesthetic sensibility. And whether we call them art, I don't care. I'm happy though to call art the cave paintings and other artifacts of the Upper Paleolithic. So the famous caves that you might have heard of, Lasco is about 14,000 years old, Altamira is 11,000 years old, Chauvet is between 32,000 and 38,000 years old. And in those caves there are paintings on the walls and there were other objects that have been carved from mammoth ivory and so on. And all the commentators, I would say something like 99% of the commentators say these are artworks and they don't offer you any argument for it at all. It just seems so obvious. And if you see pictures of these things, you can probably see why. The people who made them went to an awful lot of trouble to do it. They climbed down under the earth in these caves. They heated pigments that required heating up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. They built scaffolding to paint way up on the walls. And they were painting huge pictures. So the bulls in Lascaux are five meters long. I mean, these are little depictions. And they're extraordinarily accurate depictions of the animals. Though there's lots of other stuff in the caves which is hard to explain. Either finger tracings, there's lots of hand pictures, and there's lots of um, pornographic graffiti. <coughs> but you know, if you look at, you know, interestingly, I should say, Almost all the pictures of people are pictures of women, and most of the pictures of people are kind of caricatures, but the pictures of animals are extraordinary. And they're pictures of rhinoceroses, lions, buffaloes, aurochs, all the animals that existed there at that time. So most people think those things are art, and I'd be happy to agree. This isn't to say, of course, that they appreciated them as objects for contemplation. I mean, they're these caves, for God's sake. They're almost certainly connected with religious experiences or some other kind of thing. So I'm going to date, and if we're going to connect art to evolution, we're going to need A, an early date for it, and B, a fairly humble notion of art. So you know, there are people who think that you didn't get art until the 18th century in Europe, and there are some interesting reasons for thinking that. Lots of the institutions we associate with art didn't arise until then. But if we have a suitably humble notion of what art is, then it'll go back a long way, and it'll be something that's found in every culture. Um, again, the evolutionary psychologists and other people ask if um, other animals produce art. And um, there's a book by Den Desmond Morris on chimpanzee art, for example. And um, there's no question that if you give them paper and paint and stuff, chimpanzees will paint on the paper. Um, but Desmond Morris's conclusion is pretty negative, actually. Um, uh, and I think uh, a lot of the literature on this is kind of fanciful. There are people who think that artists, sorry, birds are artists. Um, and there are people who think that elephants and chimpanzees are artists. But the creature they focus on um, it's interesting, it seems to me. They focus on the the, um, the bowerbird. Bowerbirds are a genus of 18 or 20 species found in Australia and New Guinea, and they build um, different kinds of structures, including sort of two meter long things with parapets and you know, very weird looking structures. And these aren't nests; these are places where the males display, and females go from one to the other, make their choice. The people who first found these, or at least the Europeans who first found these, thought they were made by people. It didn't occur to them that they were made by animals, in fact, birds. They're, these are such elaborate structures. Now, I don't think that the bow birds are artists. I don't think we think the peacock is an artist just because he grows his tail. And I think that what the bow birds are doing is, as it were, building a tail. And they do it in very species-specific fashions. Lots of the scientists will tell you a story about bird culture, which is the way in which birds learn what they're doing and differ from place to place. All that's true, but I think it's very stereotyped behavior. 
So I don't think bower birds are artists. I think one reason why they get the focus is A, because Darwin talked about them, and B, because the people who are looking for artworks think they ought to be looking for artefacts. And when you look around the animal world, there aren't that many that create artefacts, but bower birds do. I think that's just a mistake. If you're looking for animal artists, you should look for singers and dancers. Um, so, are there an, any animal artists? Um, I suspect the best candidates are humpback whales, and that's because they don't just sing, they have a generative song. So they keep changing it in ways that make it look a bit like what artists do. But again, you know, I'm kind of agnostic about this. So that's the aesthetics and art. What's evolution? Evolution is the theory of natural selection, as proposed by Darwin, but then as amended in the light of Mendelian genetic theory, it's because Darwin didn't know what the method of transmission was. Um, so that's okay. We've got natural selection. There's also sexual selection. Many biologists treat that as a subcategory <coughs> of natural selection. It's, it's a sort of interesting case. It's, it's both like natural selection and it isn't. If you think that your conspecifics and people of the other sex or gender are just part of your environment, then it's easy to tell a story in which it's like natural selection, because natural selection is fitting to your environment in a certain kind of way. On the other hand, if you think natural selection is a randomly driven process, this doesn't look like it, because this is driven by the selections of your fellow human beings. Anyway, if we count sexual selection, it's easier to argue for a connection between art and evolution, because artists say, you know, do you want to come upstairs and see my etchings? And you know, it's a great way of showing off. And showing that, like the peacock, you can waste time on a completely useless activity, which shows your fitness for doing everything else. So add sexual selection into the picture. Um, what else are we going to add? There are um, a couple of options Basically, if you allow for group selection, so if you allow that the units of selection are not genes or individual people, but groups, it might be easier to get a connection with art. Um, though uh, group selection is controversial in certain ways. If you allow gene culture co-evolution, which we almost certainly should, it might be easier to get a connection with art. Um, so you know, we can tweak evolutionary theory up to a point to make it easier or harder to establish a connection with art. Um, for the most part, when I do it, I focus more on um, natural selection and sexual selection than stuff about group selection. There's also a theory known as, um, I forgot what the name of it is, Devel developmental systems theory. Um, one of the co-authors of that theory is at the University of Auckland, it's Russell Gray in the psychology department. That's a view according to which um, all that matters for evolution is that the resources that are needed are available to each generation in a regular way, not that they're matters of genetic inheritance at all. They could be that or they could be cultural. So that's a kind of theory that might make it easier to include art in the story because it includes culture in the story very straightforwardly. Um, but I don't you know, focus very much on those theories. Chapter four, what are the connections? Um, the obvious connections would be art is an adaptation or art is a byproduct of something else that's an adaptation, so it's a spandrel, or Another possibility that I'll explain more clearly later on is that art is a technology, basically. A bit of culture not really connected much with evolution at all. Um, if we were looking for connections, what would we expect to find? We would expect to find a whole lot of universals in arts that are pan-cultural. And not just pan-cultural, maybe universal in the sense that every person has them as part of their genetic disposition. That would be so if that were true, that might be evidence that these were adaptations for our ancestors and they were so successful as such that we've got them, as we've got all sorts of other things that were adapted for our ancestors. Um, and when you look around, there are plenty of universals to be found across the arts, and I'm not going to go into that in any further detail. But there are some warnings that you need to heed as well. 
and I keep returning to a couple of cases in the book. One is feathers. Um, what are feathers adaptations for? If you ask most people, they'll say flight. And of course they're wrong. Feathers, the original feathers do not sustain flight at all. They're almost certainly either for thermoregulation or for catching insects. So does that mean that flight is simply a spandrel? That would be weird, given its role in the lives of birds. And the answer is, I think, no, it'll have to be an adaptation. But now, if it's an adaptation and it's not feathers, where is the adaptation? And the answer is in certain structural changes that happen to feathers, as a result of which, plus other things, as a result of which they became suitable for flight. So we're working out whether you're looking at an adaptation or a spandrel is no straightforward matter at all. Uh, you've got to work out things about the role of it in the ecology of the animal, and you've got to work out if it's not this, is it a change to this that made it an adaptation, and so on. Um, another example that I keep returning to, so that, that's a, you know, the story of feathers is a general warning about it's not easy to sort adaptations from spandrels and work out what's going on. Um, another story I return to is the foot of Archaeopteryx. Ar Archaeopteryx was the first bird, so you know, the first story about feathers is also the story about Archaeopteryx. But this is a story about its foot. The philosopher of biology, Daniel Dennett, has got this essay about how wonderfully adapted the foot of Archaeopteryx is for perching first bird. I mean, small dinosaur that looks like a bird, first bird probably. Um, now the problem with what Dennett says is we know it's false. How do we know it's false? We know that Archaeopteryx got its foot from an earlier line of dinosaurs that all had the same kind of feet and there was no real modification to the foot. And so even if it's true that it allowed Archaeopteryx to perch in trees and even if that gave Ar Archaeopteryx an advantage, the structure of the foot is not an adaptation for that advantage. So again, you can't tell whether things are adaptations simply by working out that they're advantageous for the creature. It depends on the history. Okay, part two, the aesthetic. How am I going for time? This is kind of oh. um, <clears throat> We may never get to the third part. Uh, Landscape aesthetic. The general thesis here is our ancestors came to like in the environment the things that were conducive to a good life in that environment. And what were they? I mean, they're not difficult things to work out. You want fresh water. You want prospect and refuge. That is, you want to be able to see around you, but you want to be able to shelter. And evolutionary psychologists are always keen to point out that this is reflected in the price of real estate today. What is the most expensive real estate in New York? It looks down on Central Park with its lake. So there's that kind of story to be told. We can also tell the, the negative side to that story. The things people are going to find ugly will be things that aren't conducive to their flourishing. Think how we feel about ticks and cockroaches and stuff like that. Um, now, evolutionary psychologists move beyond that general story about where these preferences might have been established as aesthetic preferences. The idea is, by the way, it's not just that they thought, oh, that'll be a good place to live. The idea is that they found it beautiful and attractive or ugly and repelling. And as it were, the aesthetic dimension lights up the story to motivate people. It's a way of, as it were, giving oomph to the judgment. It's not just that they thought, oh, that looks okay. They thought, that's beautiful and we're drawn to it. So how can we expand this story? What evolutionary psychologists claim is that for the most part we're adapted to, we haven't changed very much. That is, humans haven't changed very much in the last 20 or 30 or 40,000 years. But we did adapt to the environment that existed back then when we lived as hunter-gatherers. And the environment that those people lived in was the savanna. So the claim is that we probably have a vestigial aesthetic interest in savanna over other habitat types. And there's some interesting tests of this. A very famous test showed that children of about the age of eight, when they're shown pictures and asked which where they'd like to live, explore and so on, kept on selecting savanna. 
Once they get older than that, they select the environments they're most familiar with. And the interpretation of this experiment by psychologists was that you know, these children were, were, were displaying this vestigial aesthetic preference for savannah um, and it got overridden as they got older. In fact, there's two reasons to think that this experiment is wrong or wrongly interpreted. The first is, um, because these are all American children, the first is what they might have been responding to was the savannah of the American backyard, which is where they were raised for the most part, rather than the African savannah which they'd never seen. So, you know, in fact, there are lots of aspects of modern urban environments that mimic those of the savannah. But the second objection I think is more damaging. It turns out that, and this is very clearly proved, it turns out that the preference children have for complexity in pictures changes as they grow older. Eight-year-olds like pictures of a low level of complexity and it you know, goes up from there. When you analyze according to the measures of complexity, the pictures that they're shown, the pictures of Savannah are simpler. So what they, the preference might be being displayed not for a habitat, but rather for a picture of a certain kind. And now we can, in fact, move on to attack the Savannah hypothesis, as it's called, on other grounds, which I think are conclusive. The first thing is, it, the assumption is there was a stable environment in which our ancestors evolved, and they evolved characteristics to respond to the features of that environment. It turns out, when they do the analysis, there is no stable environment called the one labelled by evolutionary psychologists the environment of evolutionary adaptation. Everywhere, not only over the last five million years, and over the last 200,000 years when you've got human beings, what you get is massive fluctuations in climate conditions. Uh, and some of these were extremely rapid. So in the last ice age, there were something like 20 events when the average temperature rose by 10 degrees centigrade completely changed that and then it would decline for another thousand years and then it would jump. So the evidence is there was no stable en environment to which we adapted. So what story should we tell? There's a couple of options. One is that we're like the deer mouse. The deer mouse is adapted to more than one habitat though it's better suited to woodland than to um, no, sorry, it's better suited to fields, I think, than to woodland. But the point is, different populations are actually adapted to different habitats, and it's possible for them to move from one to the other. So maybe that's what we are, adapted different populations to different sorts of habitats. But I think the more likely explanation, or another is that it's purely cultural, and I don't think that's true either. If you look at the distribution <coughs> of the population across the world, it isn't random. People like the sun on their backs. And they like to be near water and things like that. So if it's neither of those, what is the answer? The quick answer is what we're adapted to is to be flexible. So that's bad news for the evolutionary landscape aesthetic. So I think the stuff with which I started is right. Of course, we like landscapes with water, trees, you know, healthy looking animals um, that we can eat and so on. Okay, on to human beauty. This is a very ticklish subject, and for a while I thought of avoiding it. One reason why it's ticklish is the whole evolutionary psychology literature about human beauty is actually about mate selection, and it's about the selection of females by males, so it's all about characteristics that men find attractive in females. And of course, females are sensitive to being characterized in these sorts of terms. So there's a big literature on what men like when it's casual sex they're after, they actually like something different when it's uh, the mother of their children that they're after. There's a literature about what women like when it's casual sex they're after, and a different story about what they like when it's the father, oh, no, let's be careful. A different story about the person who will support their children. <coughs> and what I try and do in this chapter is take on the evolutionary psychologists on their own terms. That is, I don't try and change the argument to something else. And I don't dispute the claims they make, for instance, about the uh, attractiveness of um, 
waist to hip ratio. So this is a kind of universal preference for a 0.7 waist to hip ratio in females. And that's a good marker of uh, youth and fertility. So that's what it's signifying, presumably. Um, what I try and do is argue, oh, well, hang on, before I get to that, there's a quick, we go back to the Paleolithic art again, you probably know that there's a whole lot of Venuses, um, and these are almost always fat. <coughs> and you might think that that's, you know, we, if we're looking at the ancient preferences, we should be looking at those, those figurines, and rather than the, the sort of slim models of today. Um, though the quick answer is pretty much the waist to hip ratios are preserved. It doesn't depend on <coughs> plumpness, it's just a ratio. So it can be met by things that are thin and things that are plump. Um, why would they have preferred plumpness back then and in lots of other societies? I mean, this is the thing where there is definitely cultural difference in preferences. And here we're talking about men's preferences for women body mass <coughs> index and stuff like that. The quick answer, I think, is a, is a very straightforward one and one that evolutionary psychologists can take on board. Whether you like plump or thin depends on whether you're most likely to die from an intestinal parasite or a heart attack. Because <coughs> you want your mate to survive, basically. Okay, what I do on this thing is try and turn the story from one about mate selection <coughs> to a different story about social competence. I think the story of human beauty isn't about simply attracting a mate. It's about presenting yourself in a certain way throughout a long period, I mean, throughout life, in a social context. Um, and so, without, so I, I want to change the focus from you know, the business about mate selection, which is often about fertility and all sorts of other stuff, to a, a different story about how people feel about themselves in a social context and how they present themselves in a social context and how that works for them and how it structures their identity. The fact is, of course, um, ah, it'll take me too long. I'll stop there. Um, on to humans' aesthetic appreciation of non-human <coughs> animals. In this, this is an interesting topic which hardly anyone has written about. It's not in the evolutionary psychology literature, for instance. Um, if we took it to parallel the stuff on landscape, then what we would expect is we should like the animals that played certain roles in our ancestors' lives. We should find them beautiful. We should find ugly animals that perform different roles in their lives, the negative ones. And indeed, there is some, of, some truth to this, I think. Um, but what I do when I talk about this is, in fact, try and show how broad the notion of the aesthetic is and how, even if it's got that component, which fits with the evolutionary psychologist's story, it's got a whole lot of other stuff as well. So, for example, I think we admire animals for their fitness characteristics, especially when they're things that would be fitness characteristics for us too. So we're impressed by how high they jump and how fast they run and a whole <coughs> load of other things. <coughs> but there's a biological component to that. There's also certain biological biases that affect our aesthetic attitude to non-human animals. We like ones that look like babies and that are sort of tottery. We also like furry mammal, though. So, um, and basically, the less like us they are, the harder they are for us to relate to immediately in that attractive or unattractive way. Um, <coughs> but there's lots of other things we can do with animals, and I think indeed we do. So some of those have this sort of biological bias that I was just talking about, um, but others are, are entirely different. So that, for example, if you think that um, God is an artist, you could appreciate animals as God's artworks. And indeed, lots of um, Christian literature does something like that. Uh, if you're an agnostic, that's all right. You can do it counterfactually. You can, <coughs> as it were, view them as if they were the work of some artist. You can also abstract away from their living character and view them as kaleidoscopic sculptures. It's not a bad way to look at birds of paradise, actually. Um, <coughs> so 
What I use the discussion of our appreciation of animals to do is to show the diversity of our aesthetic responses, some that are biologically based, some that aren't. Part three, art. Um, chapter eight. <laughs> I do three different things in this chapter. First of all, I, I try and work out what the claim about universality would come to. That is, suppose we think um, the appreciation of art is universal. Does that mean we're all artists? Or does it mean we're all recipients of art? Does it mean we're all experts in all of our art forms? Or is it sufficient to be expert in only one? What level of competence do you need? What counts as competence? So I go in for a discussion about that. And I'm not going to say any more. Um, second thing <coughs> I do is look at theories that claim art is an adaptation where they mean all the arts. So they put them all in a basket and say the arts are an adaptation. And the two theories I look at in particular are Jeffrey Miller's, according to which um, the arts are, he's got a sexual selection theory, so they're like a giant entertainment system with which we seduce each other. Um, I don't think this theory works very well actually. Um, so if you look at history, I mean, if, it, if it were true, then what you would hope to find would be that <coughs> male artists, and it's a story about males, first of all it's got a bias in favour of males as artists, secondly, if it were true you would expect to be able to demonstrate that they produce more offspring um, than non-artists. <coughs> and it turns out none of this seems to work. I mean, if we had the humble view of art, then mothers sing to their children all the time, right? Women are as much involved in art as men are, and clearly not to the purpose of um, of breeding, since, as I say, you know, mothers tell stories to their children, they sing to their children. This is not sexual stuff. Um, and what empirical data there is doesn't bear out the claim that artists have more children. In fact, there's an interesting study of sort of three or four hundred years of Western composers that, in which it turns out they had fewer children, the, the, the norm. Um, it's difficult to get the data on this, but you know, basically, if you look at the history of art, these people were servants. The guys who would have been able to get the women were the ones who could afford to employ this composer or this singer, not the composer or the singer, they were servants. So I don't think that theory works very well. Another general theory is Ellen Dissaniaka's, which I think is much more plausible, but again, I think is mistaken. She thinks the function of art is to make things special, and we do this to enhance <coughs> ritual, and we do that in order to build community. So she tells a story about how art is an adaptation for group benefits, or actually, actually she thinks they're individual benefits, but they tend to accrue to individuals who are in groups. Um, Again, the problem with her theory, I find, is she really, to find the common denominator, she really has to simplify things a lot. And at a certain point, she loses the interest of most art when she does it, I reckon. But, and here's a, a further point, this is the third bit of the chapter that comes out from her account. Evolutionary psychologists, as I say, think that we evolved in the, as a species in the past to conditions of that past. And so, if you ask an evolutionary psychologist what is the adaptive function of this, what they do is tell you a story about its origins. So what they do is go back to the past and try and find the origin of it. Um, and indeed, they do this for art as well. So the final part is about stuff on the origins of art. And I express a general skepticism about this. Um, that is to say, those origins might be very simple and not a very good explanation of what we think of as art today. And if there's a connection between art today and evolution, it might have come much further down the track than that. That's chapter eight. Chapter nine is art as a technology. Here's the background to this view. Some people think that what we get out of evolution as human <coughs> beings are some very general capacities intelligence and then everything else 
is scaffolded on these basic things that we've got. So you have just a small suite of adaptive behaviours that generate everything else. Our capacity to learn by imitation, intelligence, various things like that. And with that theory, most of what goes on is so removed from the events of evolution that it seems misleading to regard what's going on as, as a byproduct of evolution. As it were, the evolution just gave you a few basic things and then everything else is really cultural built on that, not, not well described as a byproduct or span. Um, and indeed we have people who argue, a guy called Anirudh Patel argues that uh, music is a technology and he compares it to fire. Now we don't have genes for fire. Um, fire is a technology. Why is it universal? Why do we have it? Because it warms our world, literally. So he compares art to a technology like fire. Um, I think he's wrong on various accounts. But really, I'm not happy with the model with which I tempt you to go in this direction. This is the model that says a few basic suites of evolutionary adaptations, the rest is culture building on that. Um, I said that I think we need a story about gene culture co-evolution and this theory is one that separates evolution from culture much more than I'm keen on. So that's a reason for not going in this direction. I also think the particular argument that compares music to fire isn't a very good one. Um, turns out fire is, is kind, of, kind of interesting and complicated. If you want to know why, read Richard Wrangham's book called Catching Fire. I mean, he argues, for instance, that uh, um, because of the way fire changed things with the result that our digestive tracts changed and we were able to extract a whole lot more nutrition from food than we could do previously, that was what gave us the spare energy to build a big brain. So he thinks fire you know, affected evolution in a whole spectacular lot of ways. Not that it's a bit of technology that's got no connection with evolution. Art as a spandrel, chapter 10. <coughs> this would be the view, and it's, a lot of evolutionary psychologists think this is the default view, actually. The idea is that art is a byproduct of things that are adaptations, but is not an adaptation in its own right. It's a byproduct of things like manual skill, intelligence, you know, all those things. Um, and a prime example of this view is uh, exemplified in Stephen Pinker's book, How the Mind Works. He says music is cheesecake for the mind. So it's kind of rich food that stimulates all sorts of stuff for us, and that's why we like it, but it doesn't stimulate us to any evolutionary effect. So this is regarded as a, uh, you know, uh, this is a widely held view. Um, and it may be right, though I have this reservation about it. I think that, at least for humans, something like norm, form becomes norm. So take, take some couple of things that are typically described as spandrels. Male nipples, though this may be selling them short, but male nipples are <coughs> identified as spandrels. Navels are also spandrels. Um, but ask yourself, would you want to marry someone without nipples or a navel? And the quick answer is no. You know, although these are cheap and, and formal properties, they become normative for us in the way that they operate. Now, evolutionary theorists say, well, there's no value to these things, though, because the only signals that are useful to us are ones that are costly. So if I can signal my fitness to you by engaging in some very costly behaviour, then the runt next to me cannot succeed in imitating me because he can't afford to pay the price. So the signals that are important are supposed or honest are supposed to be costly. Otherwise they would be forged. If they're easy to do, everybody would forge them and they wouldn't have any value. And the trouble with navels and nipples is kind of, they're too cheap. I think, so th this is a w way of undermining the norm becomes form argument. 
But I think, in fact, um, um, whatever you, <laughs> whatever your view on navels are. Um, I don't think art behaviours are cheap. I think they're an example of something that's universal, but expensive. And that means they can say, take on this signalling role. Once they take <coughs> on this signalling role, then they, they're not like spandrels as spandrels are usually described. So on to the theory that arts are adaptations. And here, uh, this is to say individual arts are adaptive for particular functions to them. And I look at two art forms, literature and music. You might be curious why I leave out painting. The quick answer is, although there's a whole lot of neurocognitive work on painting, almost all of it's to do with connections with perception rather than evolution. Whereas there's a literature on music and evolution, and you can triangulate between all the neurocognitive stuff that's being done on that and the theories and the psychological experiments. And similarly, there's a literature on literature and evolution. Though mostly that comes out of English departments, not out of biology departments. So I claim these theories fail. To start with, no one can agree on what their adaptation's for. Everybody's got a different story. Um, so literature is, for example, supposed to be an adaptation as for sexual selection, so it's a way of showing sexual attractiveness. Or it's an adaptation for showing social status. Or it produces group benefits. Or it develops, allows us to develop theory of mind skills. That is, it helps us learn how to interpret the behavior of other people better as intentional agents because we're let into the minds of these fictional characters. Now, it can't be all those things and be an adaptation. And it turns out it's very difficult to sort out amongst them. What I think is what emerges from my analysis of this is our propensity for narrative is an adaptation. But that doesn't get you literature. We do narrating in all sorts of contexts all the time. And our propensity for fiction is an adaptation. But again, and maybe surprisingly, that doesn't get you literature either. Because the most use we make of fiction is in counterfactual and hypothetical reasoning. In hypothetical reasoning, I say, what will happen if I do this? And in counterfactual reasoning, I say, what would have happened if the past had been different? What would have happened now? Both of those involve engaging with fictions, and they're not literature. So I don't think the story works for literature. How does it work for music? Music is even worse. It is. And you know, I could, there's about 15 things it's said to be an adaptation for, starting with um, infant-directed speech. Um, so it's to do with communicating with babies, or motherese, that's sometimes called. Um, and on and on and on, the sexual stuff, the status stuff, the group bonding. Um, it can be used to pacify, which is good. But gee, it can be used to ramp up aggression, which is what you want in the troops. And so what you get is lots and lots of different stories, many of them in conflict with each other. Right? It can't be the badge of individuality if what it does is forge group unity, for instance. And so you've got all these theories, and there's no good way of sorting between them. Now, that's bad news, because if the options were it's an adaptation, it's a spandrel, it's a technology, I've gone through all of them and argued against all of them. So I've exhausted the argument space without getting to a conclusion. <coughs> um, and the quick answer is, I don't think we're, I mean, the quick answer is, the conclusion is that all this stuff is unproved. It's not that I'm showing that it's wrong, it's unproved. We're just not in a position to sort out lots of these questions though many people naively think we are in a position to do this. The scientists are naive about art and aesthetics. The people from the humanities who do this are naive about the science. Let me give you just one example of how they're naive about the science. That story I said that you know, according <coughs> with literature helps us develop theory of mind skills. That's got to be the wrong story put like that because evolution deals with things that you inherit. 
not that you gain by practicing it later. Um, now there's a way of recasting the theory, so it can't be the extra knowledge we get from literature that's the adaptation. It would have to be something else. Really, they should be telling a story according to which it's our propensity to, or, or our capacity for extracting this information that's the adaptation. But they, you know, they're very crude the way they do this typically. That's the story.